Hi everyone and welcome to Tim Topham TV. You're watching episode number 26 with Nick Ambrosino. Now this was a podcast that I've wanted to record for some time now. Uh, ever since I read Nick's great first book, Coffee with Ray. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment, and we're going to delve into it in the actual interview with him. But today's title, Relate, Create, Educate, I guess is more about some of the philosophies of teaching. Um, now, we don't uh, stay all uh, kind of airy-fairy during the chat. We get into nuts and bolts, particularly with regard to things like language use, uh, complementing students, um, the best ways for you to become more of a facilitator rather than a teacher and why that's the case and what that actually looks like and what it means. Um, and a whole lot of other stuff, it just kind of uh, overviewing a number of aspects of teaching. So we're not kind of diving into one little thing like group teaching in a past episode or an exam board. This is a little bit more holistic um, and I know you'll enjoy it. Let me tell you about Nick too. If you haven't heard of him, Nick is a leading expert um, in helping teachers, parents, and students of all ages in the field of human potential and excellence. And he's been, he's been doing it since 1986. He started his career as a public school music teacher and then launched his own private education company in 1988. Now, he's a renowned learning specialist, coach, and speaker for his work with thousands of students, teachers, and parents on creating explosive growth in accountability, productivity, and self-esteem. Uh, and look, people turn to Nick to help them become better motivators and facilitators. And I think when you read the book, and I highly encourage you to do uh, to do that as soon as you can, um, you'll get this idea uh, of what he's talking about. Now, he's actually got two books out. The first one's called Coffee with Ray, which funnily enough was the bestseller list on the bestseller list from my site on Amazon uh, last year. So the number of people, the, to the top number of people um, who went over to Amazon from my site actually ended up buying coffee with Ray and I know will have enjoyed it thoroughly. He also has a second book, which is a follow-up called Lessons with Matt. Um, both are fantastic. And uh, look, I, I, I liken them to a kind of combination fiction novel um, and pedagogical textbook. Um, so you'll read it just like a story and suddenly realize that you've got to go and get a pen and paper and start writing some ideas down because they're so brilliant. But it's not a dry textbook. It's, be it's beautifully written uh, in this fantastic story that he tells. Now, I've got a fantastic uh, download for you for this episode as well. I'm putting three things together. The first one is I'm putting together uh, my recommendations of the best quotes that I've picked out of his books, and we talk about a few of them in the interview. So I've got them all listed by category. There's two pages of them, and I thought they could be good for you to actually print out if you've got a chance before listening to or watching this episode. It doesn't matter if you don't, but it's always there for you if you want. Um, and it's just a way of sort of um, reminding you after listening to it, you could pop it on your, on your desk or something like that, about some of the things that we talked about uh, to help see if you can try and incorporate uh, one or two of the ideas into your future lessons. We've got two other things in the download pack for this episode. Uh, first one is ways to get a student unstuck. And this is a great article by Nick um, on exactly that, how to see if you can break through to a student who's on the borderline of quitting or just doesn't seem to be getting anywhere. He gives some great tactics there. And his second, uh, sorry, the third download in the download pack is a document called You Do Have Time for Practicing. Um, and this is for particularly kind of your teenage students, I guess, who don't think they've got enough time for practice. Uh, Nick actually goes mathematically through a student's day and week and works out how much time they actually have to practice. It's the sort of thing you could actually give to parents or students if they're old enough and say, hey, you do have time to practice and let me show you why that is the case. So those three downloads will be a part of his download pack. It'll be available on the show notes page. If you'd like to grab that, all you need to do is head to timtopham.com forward slash episode 26 and the other show notes and links will be there. Uh, and please remember too, if you have a chance uh, at the start of this year, I'd really appreciate a review on iTunes if you haven't already done so. Uh, if you're interested in the instructions for how to do that, head to timtopham.com forward slash iTunes tunes uh, and all the information is there. So let's get straight into it. Here is my interview with Nick Ambrosino. All right, Nick Ambrosino, so great to have you on the show uh, all the way from Long Island, New York. I've just been enjoying your accent while we've been having a little bit of a chat, uh, but welcome. 
Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here, Tim. <laughs> so, look, uh, I came to know about your work through your first book, Coffee with Ray, which I've blogged about. Uh, hopefully, lots of piano teachers will have already heard about. If they haven't heard about it, then, uh, well, they're missing out big time, and we're going to talk a lot about some of the ideas that you present in there. But before we get into the book, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, maybe the kind of teaching that you do now, how you spend your time um, as it relates to teaching? Yeah. I started um, my music education company back in 1988. I had a uh, short stint with the public school system in New York, and um, we didn't play nice in the sandbox too well, so um, it was time to start my own company. Um, <laughs> like many teachers out there, the, pro the processes that I was using were very successful with my students, and um, it forced me to build a company, not just be a private piano teacher. So okay. the company's been in existence for uh, 27 years now. Um, it has 18 teachers. Oh, excuse me. It has uh, 12 teachers now that are that service clients using the philosophies that we think about here. The teachers can certainly go about using their methodologies, but the thinking has to be the same. And um, the thinking for me really came out of the fact that I always have looked at education as the person is the most important, and then the second part is the musician. And finally, however that instrument, that, that person decides to express themselves, whether it's on drums or clarinet, the, so the technician, in, this, in my case, the pianist. Yeah. Um, and I got, to play on, I got to play in that field for, under my rules, which was a wonderful thing to do. Uh, I have my degree in music education. Uh, I was trained classically, um, not a conservatory, but we went to uh, you know music education. Mm -hmm. And uh, but choose really for me choose to do jazz and and rock and roll and stuff like that. There you go, very cool. Um, and just just while I think about it too, just watch when you uh, when you're tapping the table, it's coming through the microphone too. Sometimes okay, cool. that's all. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Um, so tell us a little bit. Uh, sorry, actually, I was just thinking, are you still running? You're still running that studio. Yeah, yep. yeah. We, we service. We, I've worked with kids from ages two years old, and now older student. Now he's ninety two. So um, man. we we still run that. The name of the company is Music Simply Music, and um, yeah, right. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, so how did you come? Because uh, I mean, a lot of us are obviously teaching and doing all the stuff that goes along with that, but not many of us have decided to write a book. So how on earth did you go from being a teacher and running your studio to writing a book? Well, after being hounded by many people who said, hey, you know what, you got to put that in a book, you got to put that in a book. And really, I think the thinking is for many of us is that, hey, we're not really doing anything special. We're just doing what makes sense for this student. And for me, it was, it was really that process for me for a long time going, well, listen, anyone can really figure this out. This is, if you just, you know, take a second to think, way X doesn't work, we need to use way Y. Mm -hmm. So it really was more of a question for me going, did I really have anything valuable to share? And it was actually after about um, when my uh, youngest son, so I have three children. I have a 21-year-old daughter, a 19-year-old daughter, and my son is 14. And when he was, um, I guess he was in, no, actually it was my, yeah, my son. He was in middle school, beginning of middle school. I had great respect for his middle school music teacher. We, mm -hmm. we became good friends and all. And there was one time I went in there and we were speaking about something. And um, in a way, with regard to interacting with the student, and um, I just rattled off something. We were having donuts over breakfast or something one morning before school started. Donuts. Do, said, do you guys really you really eat donuts for breakfast over there? <laughs> what else do you eat? <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be I'm like do donuts and bagels. That would be like what I would expect from a East Coaster. <laughs> yeah, bagels, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Love it. Sorry, go on. No. Um, and just in case you're wondering, no, you can't get bagels anywhere but in New York the way they're supposed to be made. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Thought that might be coming. <laughs> Let me just make an adjustment on my fan. Hang on. Um, <laughs> so after she said that to me, I actually turned to her and I said, hey, Jen, I said, this is nothing. This isn't anything special. She goes, it may not be special, what you, but it's how you're saying it. Yeah. And it really deserves to be put in a book. And that was the thing that pushed me sort of over the edge and went, you know what? I'm tired of people asking me to write a book and me telling them, no, no, no. So I'm going to shut them all up and I'm going to write the darn book. <laughs> oh, and look, we are so glad you have. I, I, I've never come across, you know, it's a really special book for me because it's, 
there are so many textbooks out there, right? You know, how to teach piano, piano this, Chopin that, uh, you know, Beethoven sonatas, all this kind of stuff. And they're all textbooks and they're all very dry. They're, they're fascinating in their own way, but they're very dry. You've taken that, you know, these incredible ideas and a lot of them are a lot better, I think, than what are in a lot of other books. You've, these concepts of pedagogy and effective teaching and you put it into a story. Uh, so it's just, you know, everyone loves a story. Uh, I was uh, talking to some friends recently about um, how I like to improve my storytelling when I present uh, because it's just such an engaging thing. So here you are, you've told this great story. So can you give us a little overview? What happens in the book uh, and how, yeah. how does that work? Well, in response to your question, it was interesting because it did start off as a textbook. Oh, did it? That's really interesting. Yeah. And I was bored on page 10 writing it and I knew... <laughs> And I knew people would be bored reading it, in which case meant they wouldn't get to the end of the story. Yeah, yeah. And for me, the end of, the, the end of Coffee with Ray is sort of like, um, you know, when you finish that cereal box, there used to be a little toy at the bottom of the cereal box. Mm -hmm. There's a little toy at the end of Coffee with Ray, as there is in Lessons with Matt. Um, and my real, the, the model I used for writing that book was a, a, an author that uh, I held very dear to my heart as I grew up. His name was Og Mandino. Okay. And he wrote um, a book, you know, Rogman, you know, no, he wrote no, a I don't book. actually, no, I don't. Oh, he wrote a wonderful book called The Greatest Miracle in the World, which was one of the first books when I was 17 or 18, I read that made me start thinking, hey, there's other books out there besides the stuff that making us read in school that can impact my life. Yeah. And um, Og always had something special at the end of his books. So when I wrote the book, I really wrote it in, um, in sort of a, a, a memorial to, to him. He had passed away. Um, so I wanted to write in his style, and he was a storyteller. And my feeling was that if it's a good story, you're going to want to get to the end of it, so you're going to read the whole book. Absolutely, so that's, yeah. That, that whole, that's why it came came to be the way it is. So I'm glad that it impacted you that way. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, just so it is so different, and your writing style, uh, yeah, it, it it captured me. Loved it. <laughs> and, Thank you. And you're Thank obviously you. a coffee fan. Am I right? Huge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there's would you say coffee? Is that right? Coffee? No, no, no. 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 <laughs> Some of the New Yorkers will tell you coffee, but we say coffee. Coffee, okay. So um, <laughs> and look, I'm a, I'm a complete – in Australia, we call people who are really into coffee a coffee snob. So I'm, I'm okay. a real, real coffee snob here. And I live in a part of oh. Melbourne which has just incredible coffee everywhere. So it's proper espresso coffee. So I, I also love the fact – and any other coffee fans will love the fact that you talk in quite great depth at many stages <laughs> in the book about the coffee – that the characters are making for themselves and the crema and the pour and the drip and all. It's great. I, I, loved, I loved it. That's well, not to, that's not to, to say it's... Heart, what's that? You're dear to my heart that you actually <laughs> quote all those references. I had a friend who was a tea drinker and went, I like the book even though I drink tea. That's what he actually said. <laughs> online. Yeah, well, I, sh I should say it's, not a, it's definitely not a technical book about coffee, uh, but the little side notes you make for someone that likes it, uh, it was really um, captivating, I think is the word. Um, <laughs> right. So in the book, um, just tell us uh, about the main, the main characters and just a really basic overview of what happens. Yeah, so Matt is a disillusioned piano teacher who um, I think like all of us has sort of hit a wall and you, you come home from those days. You know, in my house, the beginning of the book um, is very uh, autobiographical and that there was a point I'd come home and I'd, um, I'd come into the house and my wife would ask me how my teaching day was and I'd say, I just wish I was making pizza today. I said, I was just, um, I just, I, I'm banging my head against the wall. You know, and some of those interactions you see at the beginning of the book was exactly what I'd say, which is that, Pizza doesn't resist becoming a pizza, but gosh, I'm in the I'm in the business of change, and for the most part, people don't want to change; they want to stay who they are. But my business is based upon the fact of growth, mm -hmm. and growth means change. So, um, so it was Matt's a disillusioned piano teacher who happened to come across, um, goes to a cafe, and he comes across a man that at first he doesn't really take a liking to quite quite too quickly, mm -hmm. and um, they form a friendship that changes both of their lives. And the man he meets is called uh, Ray, uh, right. but he's not a piano teacher as such, is he? Not at all. Not at all. As a matter of fact, we really don't know um, a lot about him in the first book. Um, and that's, I think, why the second book, Lessons with Matt, came to be, because there were some unanswered questions um, in the first book that some of my readers had requested. So how does this, it, well, what a, more about Ray, what happened here? 
So there's some backstory about Ray we learn a lot about in the second book um, that answers a lot of the, some of the questions that were left purposely unanswered in the first. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you talk in the book a lot about this idea of facilitation. Uh, and I just mm. want to dive into that a little bit. We're, we're just going to, as we were talking just before I, I hit the record button about this interview, and it's going to be a little bit, a little bit more fluid than perhaps my other ones because um, Nick in the book shares so many interesting ideas that all link together somehow, but I'm not the kind of the writer that can pull it together. So we're going to, we're going to just do it a little bit off the cuff today, but I want to talk about facilitation first up. And I want to give you a quote from the book that I really liked. And it says this, teachers tend to think about teaching as a subject. When you redefine yourself as a facilitator, you become responsible for, for, for facilitating your student through the learning of how to teach him or herself. And so you talk a lot about seeing ourselves as facilitators and providing an optimal learning environment where the student can choose actually whether they want to learn or not to, which is kind of where you said you're at at the start of the book. So what's yeah. the main difference between this idea of teaching and facilitating and how does it actually look in practice? Well, the, the main difference actually is even something that I think you, you might, we might get into later on is this idea of a diamond distinction. So often for me, so um, a diamond distinction for me is a word change the, a small word change that creates a big lever in your in your in your mind that um, allows you to see things differently and ultimately feel differently and act differently. So for me, when I when I started really sitting back um, and playing with my idea that I was a piano teacher on my head, some of the some of that comedic voice in my head started speaking to me, and and, and the conversation went something like this: "You're a piano teacher, but well, pianos don't need to learn." <laughs> yeah. Pianos, pianos are simply fine being pianos on their own. So, you know, that was sort of comical, but then it made me think, I guess that's correct. You know, p pianos fine being. So what am I actually doing here in this career I've chosen? And um, so the difference for me is a teacher is responsible for, um, for de imparting knowledge about a subject. So you have your physics teacher, you have your chemistry teacher, your math teacher. I think the teachers of the arts have a little bit of a, of a, a different challenge if they decide to accept it. Not that a science teacher can't interact this way, but because we're dealing with emotions as an artist, um, we have a, a prime opportunity to really impact our students as human beings. So I'm not interested in teaching the subject of music or the, or the or piano. I have the skills to do that, and certainly that's how most people see me when they first hire me as their piano teacher for their child. However, what soon comes to be different, in they, they recognize difference, is that what I'm really doing is facilitating their child or that student through the process of learning at the piano. So whenever I have a challenge with a student, what I'm really looking to do is, is it gives me a sort of it gives me a um a hierarchy on how to backtrack and what to do. So is the challenge a musical challenge? Okay, well that's easy. Then we go to our musical skills and we figure out what exercise or piece we need to do or fingering or whatever it is we need to do. Often the challenges aren't musical. The challenges are personal. Mm. And that's where really being the facilitator comes in, which is teaching the kids the skills they need to get through. And even adults, I'm finding now, I teach more adults as my career goes on, and I'm finding the adults are, are don't have the strategies and skills to get through many of the obstacles they've been dealing with for 65, 70 years in their lives. Mm. So the facilitation is really about educating that human being on becoming their own teacher. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's the, the crucial thing that as teachers – we have to be moving towards now if, if we're not already. It's certainly happening. Uh, I'm in a school-based context, so I, I uh, am lucky to have a lot of professional development around the classroom. And yeah. there is absolutely the, the move and the realization that teachers are no longer the wise old know-it-alls who just have to regurgitate everything they know and the students just have to lap it up and then spit it out at, at exam time. Um, because students have far more knowledge in the palm of their hands in their phones than the teacher can ever have in their head so we can never know <laughs> enough anymore it's not about that Absolutely. i think that's what you're getting to yeah i think you're right if they need i mean if they need facts they can go to google and search it on online right but what they don't what often and 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 especially um 
it's become disconcerting to watch some of the this generation, the millenniums, um, deal with this. What they often don't know how to do is what to do with that information. Yep. So there, there. I mean, there's a wonderful book out there now um, named uh, "How to Raise an Adult" that I think I I I, I wrote a little review for um, online. And one of the things she speaks about is that often the students today are algorithmic machines. If you give them something to do, they will do it. For, a thousand times an hour. Mm. But if you ask them to create the path from point A to point Q, they're lost because yeah. they don't know how to learn. And for me, I, I hey, if my kids become musicians, that's fine. I mean, if they become professional musicians, that's fine. That's not really what my goal is at. I want them to have the gift of music, but more importantly, I want them to have the skill sets to achieve whatever it is that's important to them in their life. And I get to interact with them in a way to do that disguised as a piano teacher. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Um, there's a there's a tiny little rattle when you speak. Is that is that something you can hear on your end, or is that just? Let me see, hold on. Tell me if uh, this is it. Is that better? Yes, I think that's better. Yeah. Okay, with the fan. Okay. Oh, is that, is that, are you going to expire, or are you, are you okay for a little bit? Yeah, that I, one? Have to, okay. uh, I have to dab my forehead every now and then. <laughs> okay, that's great. <laughs> Hey, I want to pick up on something you were talking about, and you mentioned a lot. You, you do a lot of this in the book, um, and I'm a I'm a huge advocate for word usage, and and this comes up over and over again in the book about how you use words properly in teaching. So um, I, I picked up as I was reading um, a few sort of things that you contrast in there. The word or the uh, the um, the experience of reacting. To something versus responding is something that yeah. you you explore, and you also uh, have have this concept of talking about whether is something actually hard, or is it just unfamiliar, or is it new, and how using the different words affects your take on your ability to do those things. So, are you able to talk to that for a bit? Yeah, you just brought up what we were speaking about earlier is that idea of a diamond distinction, right? Yeah, that, that's it. That little word. Yeah, that little word change that creates a completely different headset, you know. So for years, again, it, it, I heard, you, we all hear it. The kid, you give a kid a new piece and he goes, this is too hard. You know, and what do you do with that information? You can certainly interact as the cheerleader and uh, tell them, you know, no, it's not. You can do it. You know, you're good enough. And you bring them through that. But what you leave them with is the fact that, as, as you'll see, I think in the second book, in, in Lessons with Matt, um, there's a point where um, Matt references a historical point for himself where he speaks about this idea there was a student who once said it was too hard and he forced her through the challenge by baiting baiting her along the way and at the end he was psyched because she achieved it and she felt no better about herself mm. and that's autobiographical because I wrote I did that at the beginning of my career you know I was I was the cheerleader I jumped around the sides and went yes you can do it you can do it and we forced our way through and the student turned to me at the end I was shocked because she wasn't happy <laughs> I can't believe you're not happy. You said you couldn't do it. We can do it. She goes, no, we didn't do it. You did it. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. I just supported her in her belief that she wasn't good enough to do it herself. Mm. Time to sort of rethink this. So um, the rethinking is, hey, what is it really hard? I mean, is, really, is hard really the accurate word? And, and uh, hard has, you know, for me, hard has this feeling of um, it questions my potential. When you say, if you, if you say to yourself right now, you say, hey, this is too hard, that feeling is a stop sign inside. And yep. I'm not interested yep. in stop, right? Can you feel that? This is too hard. Wow. I guess I'm not good enough and all the stuff that goes along with that, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm not interested in stop signs. I'm interested in at least yellow lights or green lights you know, or yield signs. Um, hey, this is new and unfamiliar. If you say that, that's a different feeling. Yeah, it's more there's like a, there's an exploratory thing going to happen next sort of thing, isn't it? It's like, yeah, oh, there's an explore. Invitation. Yeah, isn't there a little bit of an invitation there? Mm. Um, there's a little bit of a, hey, it is an invite. I, I, I might be able to do this, you know? Um, and that's what I'm really, really, um, that's really important to me is that, hey, just that one little tool. You know, it's, it's interesting because my son was the youngest uh, person to read, read Coffee with Ray. He's also the first person to realize it was a chronological problem and after the book was to print he had a, my wife goes nicholas has to talk to you i'm like well what's the problem he goes he's afraid to tell you about something in coffee with ray i'm like what do you mean <laughs> what's going on he goes well i don't know how to say this because you printed the book already but uh 
there's a chronological problem on like these two chapters. And he was right. Oh, really? <laughs> so, yeah, he's going to be my new proofreader for the next book. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> um, but, but the point was, is that I went to his school and um, at the beginning of last year, and he uh, had written a poem about himself called I Am. And one of the things in one of the stanzas of the poem, and a huge moment for me as a dad, was that he said, I know there's nothing too hard that I can't do, but everything is just new. Oh, wow. And I was like, wow, my own, my own kid's getting that. That's awesome, you know? Yeah, that's great. And, yeah, and so that's the distinction for me. Um, you know, I know one of the things you had mentioned is even the difference between a compliment and a validation. Mm. Okay, so another that, yeah. distinction. Yeah, so I'll, I'll help you bridge that and segue that, okay? <laughs> okay, um, yeah, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for me, a compliment has a judgment attached to it. There's a, hey, that was really good. It's also sort of knee-jerkish and sort of just you're throwing it out there. There's really no interaction. There's no st stickiness to that to a kid, especially if it's a kid with, who doesn't, hasn't yet built his own self-esteem. Yeah. Okay? Now, I, um, I want people listening to really take note of this because I think we all do this. Hey, mm. great job. You played that so well. It's like it, it, and I know I've blogged about the fact that it comes out too fast for me. I, I have to stop myself saying good when they finish playing something, even if it was rubbish. It's just like an yep. automatic, I'm a positive person. Students like good feedback. So that's a compliment, right? Good job. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is that's okay. Um, and, and then we'll go back, go back. We'll remember on the side note, we'll go back to the idea about good feedback in a minute because I think there's something important in there. Okay. So for, someone who doesn't, so for someone who doesn't have a strong sense of self-esteem, if I say to them, let's just take it out of music concerts for a second. Hey, I like your shirt. Uh, no, uh, that's a nice shirt. Mm -hmm. They'll say something like, oh, this, oh, I got it on the sale rack. Or my mom bought it for me. They just don't know how to accept the fact that there's something good there, right? But a validation on the flip side of that, one, it takes a little bit of thought, on, a little more thought on the, on the part of the teacher. And two, is it gets to stick to the student who doesn't necessarily have that belief in himself. So a validation isn't a judgment, it's a statement of feeling. Okay, so, so when you, you better give us an example. Way. What's a validation? Yeah. yeah, so when you played it that quickly, I felt really excited. It was really exciting for me to listen to that. Okay. So it's my feeling about what you did. Now, those can go both positive and then a negative validation is more like feedback, okay? Okay. So you had, so you had originally said uh, before you said um, you're a positive person, right? Mm -hmm. And you want to give good, good feedback. I, again, another distinction is the difference between good feedback and effective feedback. Yep. Go on. So good feedback might make them feel good, but it might not be effective in making them feel get better. <laughs> okay, yeah. Right, so my I don't feel my job is really to make them feel good. That's their job. My job is to provide them a course by which they can grow. Say that again, because I reckon that was great. Yeah, my job is not to make them feel good. That's not my, my job in my relationship, even with my wife, isn't to make her feel good. Is to provide a nurturing environment in which she can choose to feel good or not. But that's not my responsibility. Yeah. Okay. And for our students, uh, an environment whereby they can uh, do the things that they need to to make them feel good about themselves yeah. and their performance. Yeah. And when they don't, they get honest feedback from me, and and that certainly create. You know, you had mentioned about create, relate, create, educate, right? Yeah. So this applies. This applies to that simply because you can't give honest feedback to someone who doesn't feel you're acting in their best interest because they're going to get defensive. Hmm. Okay. So often. Teachers are so interested in educating first that they forget there's a process here. One is that you have to create a level of rapport, a level of relationship with someone so there's a, a trust and a faith that you're going to act in their best interest. Yep. And then after you do that, you create an environment of learning readiness together. And then you can finally educate. You know, every good salesman understands the relate, create, educate process. Because if you walk in and they try talking to you about their car that you're trying to buy and the engine size and how fast it goes and don't create relationship with you, you're, and meanwhile, you're looking for a minivan because you have a family of seven. They miss, <laughs> yeah. They, they miss and they're, the boat, and they're showing right? you the motorcycle. Yeah. Exactly, right. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. It goes so fast. Oh, I don't need to go yeah. fast. I need to go safe. Yeah, yeah right? that's right. So the same thing with this is that for me, that I spent a, a, an incredible amount of time first – Letting my students know that I am 
an advocate for their potential. And I will not support them in anything less than that. An so advocate if they, for their potential. I like that. Yeah. So I won't. So when they tell me they can't do something, I will go, okay, so what do you want to do about that? Do you want to just give up or do you want to figure out how to do it? Mm. You know, um, so the, the whole idea of that validation is I want it to stick to them. And if I have to do a, a feedback, you had spoke about feedback, that's not necessarily positive. They'll know if I'm lying, so why would I want to do that to them? You know, if they play the piece like rubbish, like you had said, which is a word we never use here, so I'm going to use it a lot, I think. Um, <laughs> what do you use? Do you use trash, yeah? Yeah, we use trash or but you garbage. But yeah. you wouldn't use it. Oh, God, you'd say garbage in that context. That's you? garbage. Yeah, that's yeah, not, yeah, that's not, yeah. Right? Um, if they play it that way, I'll look at them and I'll, especially, you know, certainly not with the younger kids, you know. They were going to be a little bit more, I think, a lot more lenient about that. Mm. But as you get to your twelve-year-olds, they need they need honest feedback to become. Yeah. To, so I'll look at them. I go, listen. I know you want me to tell you that was awesome, but you're also smart enough to know when I'm lying to you. <laughs> so do you really think that sounded awesome? That that we got to celebrate? And they'll they're honest. No. Yeah. Okay. So what do we got to do next? Yeah. So it sort of removes this whole idea that I got to go around. You know, if you find if you look behind me. This plate. Can you see this plate? I can. Yeah, it's a right, bright, so it's one of those bright green plates. plastic plate yeah. by the looks of things, is it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things the clowns spin. Oh, yeah. Okay. You know what I'm talking about? They spin them on a on a stick. Yeah. yeah. I'm. I'm. I use that. No idea why that's in your uh, your room though. Yeah. So they spin them on. I won't be able to do it. So they spin it on a stick, right? Okay. So I start one of my seminars over that because my job. I got tired of running around spinning my students' plates, motivational plates. You need to teach them to do it themselves. Yeah. So if you ever seen the, the circus, you know, the clown starts off, he's got 15 plates spinning. Everyone, he gets to number one, then he runs out to 15. When he's at 15, what happens to number one? It's about to fall over. Got to run back, yeah. right? Exhausting, yeah. right? But if you teach them, this, give them the skills to spin their own plates, as a teacher, we can sit back and really our job, and ultimately, you know, <laughs> ultimately for me, the leverage is here is, I guess I'm lazy in the way I go about this because I want to do as little work as I possibly can and create the most results. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so sensible, isn't it? It's great, right? Work so, smarter, not harder. Yeah. yeah. So as a teacher, we're emotionally... I mean, how many teachers, you come to the end of your day, you're emotionally spent. Yeah, I mean, no. you, your, your emotional bank account is at zero. you know, And you, you're hopefully going to be able to recharge by your next day. That's not acceptable anymore. The reason it's at zero is because you're taking too much of what belongs to the kid and taking it to yourself. And it needs to belong to the student. Yeah. And now that's not to say that we don't, we're not responsible for providing them with the skills to navigate that minefield, but I'm not responsible for walking the minefield with them. I'm responsible for telling them where the mines are, how to diffuse the mines. They can feel free to step on one if they want, but that's not my, my responsibility. Okay, so let's put it into a context. If And I'm sure we've all had these students that hit sort of 13, 14, 15 uh, and their motivation, they'll, they'll either skyrocket or some of them will go really down. And you get the kid yeah. that comes to a lesson, they haven't done anything and they kind of just sit there and you just you have to spend all your time. Well, I do anyway. This is my natural thing with those guys is, is like, oh, wow, it's great that you're here today and how was your weekend and, oh, let's get into this piece. And they're like, mm. so I'm doing all the plate spinning. So how do you actually change that around? That's a wonderful question. And I knew we were going to get here at one point. So that's, that's a really, just a really intelligent question, right? So the first thing is, is most teachers will start the lesson with uh, uh, choosing a piece, right? What are we going to do first, right? I don't do that. So, so for me, everything is motivated by feelings. So one, <laughs> again, a student taught me this, which is I came into a lesson and the kid didn't, this is early on in my career, kid hadn't practiced and I went through the whole you need to practice to get better. Your parents are investing money. I'm investing time. You know, the whole thing. We all know that that little speech, right? We all have that speech. And then the kid says something that was profound to me. He goes, well, I didn't agree on this assignment. You just gave it to me. Right. And I went, oh, checkmate. He won just now. He's right. <laughs> yeah. He's right. I gave him a bunch of responsibilities that I thought were appropriate, but he contractually did not say yes to. Okay, so we're going to go about doing this differently. You're going to make up your assignment this week. So when you come back next week and try to do that again, which is basically, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Tim, for me, 
I see myself, I hold a mirror for my students. I don't want them looking at me for the problems or the successes. I want them looking in the mirror for both, okay? Mm -hmm. So when a kid goes, no, you made me do that, it means the mirror is not there anymore. And he's not looking at really the, cause, the, the causes potentially of his success or their lack of. He's looking at, he's looking to blame me. Mm. Look at yourself, okay? And so I really want to be that person who holds the mirror in my lessons. So we start. I don't know what your week is going to look like this week. I say to the students, I certainly know what the next courses for you are curriculum-wise in music, but I don't know how much is going to really be good for you. So based upon your week, and you know, 15 years old, we got lots of tests happening in the United States. I don't know what it's like in Australia, but mm, we got a lot of tests. There's a lot more responsibilities. The sports schedules are getting crazy. Some kids are away an entire weekend playing uh, soccer and uh, football for you, right? Not soccer? Uh no, if it's the round ball that you kick on the ground, that's soccer. Right. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we have something to come in that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so I don't know what the schedule is. Here's what I think you need to do. You know, and I would say, you know, whatever it is, hand separately this page of the piece or this line. Do you think that's appropriate for you? And the student will negotiate. No, I don't think I can do that because my cousins are coming in from out of town and I got five tests. Okay. So let me teach you how to set a goal. You want to set a goal that you don't get immediately because there's no reward to that. You're going to board. You're going to be bored. You also don't want to set a goal that the day before the lesson you're panicking because you're not going to be able to achieve it. You want to set a goal that challenges you a little bit so, but doesn't bore you. So something that's a little bit intimidating perhaps outside your comfort zone. All my students know about the comfort zone diagram, right? So you set your goal and that's what they do. Now, the next week when we come back, I don't ask them what, if they practiced or not because everyone's going to say any intelligent student will go yes. <laughs> and in a minute, we're going to find out no. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. So I'll say to them, what did you feel proudest about this week in your accomplishments? Is this before you've heard them play anything? Absolutely. So yeah. I walk in, hi, how are you? What did you feel proudest about in your accomplishments this week at the piano? And one of two things will happen. They'll tell me something they really feel excited about or – they'll tell me nothing. And then if I say if they say nothing, it's a wonderful educational opportunity. Mm. Why not? I didn't do anything. Okay, so you don't feel proud of what you're doing? No. Do you like that feeling? No. Do you want to change it? Yes. Okay, so then set goals that are more appropriate for yourself this week. Yeah, fantastic. You redo it again, right? That's where the three little bears comes in. You know the three little bears story, right? Goldilocks and the three bears. I yeah. use it in the reference in the book. The same thing. Is it too hard? Is it too is it too, oh, much? Yeah, too much? Porridge, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So really as a teacher, I'm, again I'm stepping out. I'm coaching from the sidelines. I'm not in that in that game with them right now. I'm not on the field. I'm on the sidelines looking at the big picture and just constantly coaching them. Mm. I also like and, that you. Uh, sorry to interrupt. That, that you ask you ask questions. Uh, I, I'm I'm a, a huge fan of the impact of asking more and more questions. So rather than saying why you didn't do that and I'm disappointed and all that, all you did is you started asking questions. So why didn't you do that? Uh, how does that? How are you feeling about that? Uh, do you want to change that feeling? Uh, things like that. I, I think that is such a great way to um, to work in lessons. Um, and I actually blogged about the effect uh, that asking more questions had in my piano lessons. Um, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, I think it's so so important. Yeah, because again, it takes it off of me, but it gets them thinking. And eventually when they understand the thinking, the, the beginning of the lesson sounds like this. Um, I didn't find the time to practice this week. So we don't hear I didn't have the time. We hear I didn't find the time, which to me is a wonderful distinction saying the student's starting to accept responsibility mm. as opposed to spending like the like like they had less time in the week than any of us did, okay? Mm. It's funny because I also wrote <laughs> before I started thinking about this more sort of heuristic way about going about this, um, there's a uh, somewhere on one of the, the, the Facebook pages you and I belong to, um, there's a list. I got so frustrated once that a kid told me you didn't have the time to practice that I literally came home and I logged every – I figured out how many minutes there were in a week. Oh, yeah. Calculated minutes of sleep, minutes of eat, minutes of bathroom, minutes of computer, minutes of doing nothing, minutes of sports, minutes of religion, everything. And I still found out they had six hours a week to practice. Mm. And that one, so I used to hand that out. 
for teachers. So for the teachers who aren't ready to go to this step, if they need the evidence, just tandem that that report. It's somewhere on one of the sites, or I can send you a copy. Uh, we should, you yeah, we should uh, we should find that and chuck it up on the uh, show notes page. That would be that would be cool. Yeah, yeah I'll send. Let me write myself a note. Um, yeah, that would that would be good because you do have to do that sometimes with students, and I yeah. mean, in many ways, particularly for younger students or for teenagers too, you have to coach the parents as well, don't you? About Absolutely. the fact that, uh, and, and you talk about this in the book. I've got some notes about the fact that learning uh, is work. Oh, here's a quote. Uh, Many of your students will have the wrong idea about learning. They will have been told that learning is supposed to be fun. That's simply not true often. Learning is work and for the most part work is not fun. The feeling of accomplishment, success and pride, however, they're the motivators. They're the thing that produces the fun. Uh, And I think we have to teach parents about this idea that, you know, Nine times out of ten, a ten-year-old isn't going to, well, I, yeah, probably nine times out of ten, going to sit down regularly at the piano and practice. Yeah. Or if they do sit down at the piano, it's not going to be effective practice. Like you right. actually have to coach them to coach their child and to set aside time. I'm amazed by how few parents actually work out a practice schedule with their children. Yeah, I think you know you bring a valid point there. And again, looking at a distinction is that often parents will confuse. A child not practicing with a child not being motivated to learn an instrument. Mm-hmm. When that's not the, the problem at all. What the problem is, the child doesn't have time management skills. Yes, and, exactly. And, and, and that's not a natural thing, is it? No, it's not. I mean, everyone thinks, you know, it's funny. I had a conversation, and I'm sure that any piano teacher who listens to this is going to uh, associate with this. Had a parent call me years back, about, probably about eight years ago, nine years ago, and she was studying with one of my teachers. And um, she had a, uh, a seven-year-old or a six-year-old, right? And um, I said, you know, she said, we're going to be stopping lessons. I'm like, oh, I says, is there a problem with the teacher? Oh, no, we love her. Okay. Um, is it a financial issue, which I knew was not going to be the case because it came from a rather affluent area of, 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 our, of our county. Oh, no, not at all. Your price is very fair. All right. Scheduling issues? No. Is he not having fun in the lessons? No, he loves the lessons. <laughs> okay, you got me. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what is it? So she goes, because he won't practice on his own. And I went, well, how old is he? I knew. Yeah. So she said six. I said, so let me ask you a question. I said, "Um, does he make his dinner on his own? No. Does he do his homework on his own? No. Does he brush his teeth on his own? No. Does he go to sleep on his own? No. (laughs) So then why would you think there's a genetic disposition for practicing on their own simply because you enrolled him in piano lessons? And she said, what was, was was a checkmate move to me? She goes, oh, I understand that, but I have so much to do on my plate that I don't have. I, I can't manage his piano practicing too. Oh. I can't. I you know, you, 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 there's nothing I can do with that one, right? Yeah. Uh, so they stopped. But the point was, is that they don't have time management skills. Heck, a lot of adults don't have time management skills. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> so it's really a time management problem, not a motivational problem. And and I, the way I confront that with my parents is this: is listen. I don't want your child to get the idea that they're not good enough to play this instrument or to accomplish something. And if they don't put the time in, that's what they're going to think. And that is an inaccurate assessment. I said, um, what, the way I can ensure that that's not going to happen is you just remind them to practice for 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day or whatever it is we determine is correct. So, and I don't mean grab them by the ear and yank them to the instrument. What I mean is, hey, you know what? It's enough to, we played enough on the computer today. Time to go practice your piano. Mm. You know, my three children are wonderful musicians, and everyone goes, well, I guess they're motivated to practice on their own because my wife and I are both musicians. No, they're kids still. <laughs> <laughs> you know why they wonderful musicians? Because we go, hey, guys, you know what? You did an hour on TV. Go practice your Go instrument. practice now, yeah. We parent, you know, and a lot of parents, I think, don't want to parent. They want to be friends. And, and listen, if, if your kids don't not like you at least once a week, you're not doing your job as a parent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I like it. So, yeah, um, so that's, uh, I think it's a time management issue, not a, uh, not a, a practicing issue. And that's a parent problem, not a kid problem. Mm. All right, so I just want to kind of recap because we're covering so much ground here. We've, t- we've talked about uh, word usage um, and the difference between complimenting a kid, saying, hey, good stuff which is what I tend to do automatically and validating them. And you gave that example of, um, you know, saying, uh, 
I, re- I really liked how you put, you know, that big 14 at the end of that piece or something like that. Is that, that is, have I got that right? I just want to clarify. Yeah, you do. It's, it's yeah. your feelings about what they did. That's really your what it comes down about to. what they did, yeah. And I, I just found a quote about this actually that, that I really liked um, from your book and it says this, the point is that if you validate someone's performance, then you often use the word but to create a change in the performance. And the student mm-hmm. never remembers what came before the word but. So if yeah. you say, hey, that was really good, but, but I reckon you could go faster in that section or whatever it is. So yeah. you then go on to say, if, however, you use the word and as the invitation for a change, the student feels that he has earned the right to go on to the next part of his training and will remember the validation and create the change. Yeah. So that's yeah. like saying, um, so I, I really liked what you did in this, the middle section of this. And what about we add some dynamics now in the next section? Is that the kind of yeah. thing? You can do that or I even like to use the word as an invitation and now you're ready to. Ah, yeah, that's great. So give us an example in, con- in context. So hey, I really like the way you performed uh, you know, this section of the piece with dynamics and now you're ready to add it to the next section. Yeah, that's great. I really like that. It's such a positive, uplifting kind of suggestion. That's Thank really, you. Yeah, yeah, that's really you good. Know, my seminars, they say, <laughs> what off, what comes on the back end of a butt is often crap. Yeah. Yeah. I, I even change it when I'm writing. If I use the word but, I'll often try and see if I can change it to end. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Listen, and, and then I'm not saying that but shouldn't be used. There is a time. I think there are time and places that you can be a very, uh, you know, people look at me and they think, well, he's a, he's a very soft, gentle teacher. I, I'm, I, I guess I'm compassionate, but gentle isn't one of the words I would use. I, sometimes I'm like a bull in a china shop, <laughs> never with disrespect to my students. But um, I, there are times that um, it's not pretty in the face of that lesson. When we're, when we're dealing with a 14-year-old who just can't find the time to practice, and every week you're coming in there, um, it gets nasty for a little bit. And, mm. and, and what I mean by that is that I be, you know, <laughs> often piano teachers, I know when I was growing up, you were motivated by fear. And, and, and what I mean by that is you wouldn't dare show up to your, piano, your, your, your lesson um, unprepared, either because your teacher was really strict or because your parents were paying for and they, they didn't have the money to pay for lessons, so they came down on you. But one way or another, you were motivated by fear. And I think fear is an awesome initiator for motivation, but it's not sustainable. Yeah, sure. So there are times that, you know, with students who are having a tough time, I would say, listen, we've, we've had the same story for three weeks. Clearly what's going on right now is not working. Mm. And for me, I'm getting, I'm getting bored now sitting here listening to you do this over and over again. So we need to come up with another process. I'll make some suggestions. You tell me which one will work best for you. One of my students said, you know what? I think emailing you in the middle of the week, letting you know what I've done will hold me more accountable. Okay. Send me an email. Tell me what you did, mm-hmm. you know? So we create that strategy together. Again, I'm holding the mirror up. I don't tell them, here's what you have to do because then they can point the finger back at me. We create what's going to work for you so that you can learn this instrument and fulfill the potential that you think and you want to have on it. Mm, yep. And I was going to get to that because that was the next thing we talked about was this idea of teach, actually teaching students how to set goals for themselves. So instead of mm-hmm. us holding the uh, music diary, we call them over here, or assignment books, you guys call them, uh, and starting yep. to write. And sometimes, sometimes you know, I'm, I've, I've put my hand up and say, you know, I've written stuff and not even told them what I'm writing sometimes. <laughs> and then I expect them to go and not, not only do it, but read it as well. <laughs> Yeah, they don't read it sometimes, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I know. So, uh, and, I, and I have with a few students, and in fact, one of my students recommended I do this because we did it in a lesson. I just handed the book over to him. It was a him. Uh, and he started making his own notes. And he said, yeah. I should do this more often, shouldn't I? <laughs> yeah. And I said, yeah, I reckon you should. And I, I, I should probably do it with all my students. So, but, and it takes a little bit longer, but you know what? It's going to have a better outcome, I think. Yeah. So we talked about the goal. Help, sorry, come on. Yeah, I agree with you, especially um, that most kids don't look in their book or what their assignments are. Um, it does take a little bit longer, but what uh, you're adding another ninety seconds to the lesson, and but your but your results, that, you know, the 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 payoff, the return on investment for ninety seconds to me. And the other thing for me, I know, is my handwriting. One of my fast is illegible. Yes, as is mine. I can't even but, read my own notes, and I'm asking yeah. them to read them. <laughs> Which again. 
But, which again plays into the, well, I know you wrote the assignment, but I can't read your handwriting. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah, it. I want to remove myself from that. So you write it, you know, yeah, and yeah. I can't read their handwriting, but as long as they can, I don't really care. Yeah. Know? And that was a great segue to your idea of motivating. So you had the uh, the clown spinning the plates. And uh, so I remember that that analogy. And then you also had the uh, the vision you had in my head was you holding up the mirror as you're sitting next to them at the piano and, and trying to get them to realize that everything that goes on is about them, good and bad, not about you. That's, yeah. Yeah. It's funny because even when they, when they do something wonderful, um, one of the things I want I, when I'm validating them, like you'll see that, you know, the kid will practice and look up at you with that wonderful smile of, of success, right? And often I think we miss a key opportunity to anchor that emotion. And we'll say, hey, you know, I really like the way you play that. For me, it's more. It's more. There's so much more we can use that moment for, which is, I love the way you play that. But you know what I love even more is that smile on your face because mm-hmm. it tells me you're proud of what you did, and that's more important than anything anybody else can say to you. Yeah, I really like it. I think I'd like to come and have some lessons with you, Nick. <laughs> 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 uh, it's, just, it's just no, but it's a really uh, caring kind of approach that you have for students. And I think it's so important. It really is. It, it, but caring, but not, um, uh, but still expecting, you know, good progress and all that kind of, like it's not slack. Um, no, it's not. It's yeah. not fluff. Oh, yeah, really... I, think, I think the reason I do that is because there's going to be a day that that kid is going to do something great and feel proud. And some boss isn't going to recognize it or some teacher's not going to recognize it. And they have to be able to look themselves in the mirror and go, you know what? Regardless of the world is giving me accolades for my accomplishment, I feel proud of me. Mm, That's it. Yep. Now, in your second book, Lessons with Matt, uh, there's this great little section. uh, And people who read your books will, will find that you have these fantastic metaphors and analogies. Uh, so the, the main character, for whatever reason, is sanding. Uh, so, you know, using a sanding uh, pad on a boat. Um, and you talk about this idea of going with the grain and against the grain and the effectiveness of this. Um, so you, the quote I picked up was, and I'll tell you why I'm talking about it. People are probably thinking I'm bonkers talking about sanding a boat. But anyway, um, it says, the quote is, by moving in the natural direction of the wood, you're respecting its unique qualities. And there's a fine line between healthy motivating stress and the distress of too much resistance. And as soon as I read this, I remember thinking about the teachers that I know, often much older, and those very experienced, wise old sages that people might go to, even at at my kind of age, to get, you know, some more experience. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that go, you've been so badly taught, you need to start again with me by my method. And mm. to me, that just reminded me of this idea of here's the grain and this is someone going exactly opposite the grain and just creating yeah. from the start this, you know, terrible resistance. Um, yeah. I thankfully haven't had that experience, but I do know people who have. They've gone to, you know, an amazing, supposedly an amazing teacher who's just said, no, nah, your technique is awful. You need to start again with me and we're going to, it's going to take years sort of thing. Whereas I've luckily had great experience with teachers going, Here's where you're at, and I'm going to take you on from there. So yeah. I, I, I think what you know, you this about is that. A, this is an amazing teacher. We, um, I would question whether that's an amazing teacher. Probably an amazing performer. Yes, but an an amazing teacher wouldn't try to make a fish an antelope. If you're a fish, you're a fish. You're an antelope. You're an antelope. Yep. Yeah, that's it. I mean, unless of course there's something chronically wrong. Of course. Uh, well, but, if you went uh, for pain, yeah. Yes, if you're going exactly. every, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, that that metaphor actually, again, a lot of what you'll read in the books are is is autobiographical for me. And that metaphor came because when my wife and I redid our house over in two thousand and one, um, the budget ran low, as many oh it ran over, and we had installed these wooden banisters going up the stairs, and uh, we couldn't afford basically to have someone come in and sand them and coat them and all. So my father-in-law, who was a contractor, said, "Hey, Dad, how do I do this?" Because I really wasn't handy until I until I started having my own home, and he goes, "Oh, you just start with a coarse grit paper, then you wipe it down. You do a medium paper, and then you do a fine, and you do a steel wool." And I'm sitting there sanding, and my brain is—it's almost like it was almost like a mantra to me. It was meditative to just 
saying, and then he, and he said to me, and go with the grain so you don't ruin the wood. And I'm sanding and I'm sanding and, and I'm thinking as I'm sanding, well, this is really, this is just effective teaching because what you're doing to the wood is you're training it to be polished. Mm, yep. You can't polish f with one, you know, one type of grain uh, sanding paper. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So it's the same thing with the student. And, and, and it plays into the idea of that for me, all education, no matter what you're learning, effective education goes from general to increasingly more specific as the learner's proficiency grows. Hmm. So, you know, it's funny because I remember my first golf lesson and the golf was a, he was a wonderful golf player, horrible teacher because he stood me in front of the ball and gave me like 19 specific things to do before I swung the club. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and my brain is just spinning with all this information and the only thing I really wanted to do was hit that stationary ball forward. That was it. I didn't care what I looked like doing that. As I got better, my the, spe the specificity of the instruction became more detailed. And I often think that teachers, when you're experiencing resistance from a student, um, it's often because the specificity of the task is it, it's 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 too specific. <laughs> specificity too specific. Yeah. The um, task itself is too specific for that student. Um, and we need to sort of back out a little bit. It's sort of, uh, um, it, it's sort of like when you ever look through a telescope. Yep. Okay. So, you know, you have the, the small view find that it gives you an approximation in the sky and then the big view, the big view find that it gets you zooming in, right? Oh yeah. So you point it in the right direction first and then yeah, you zoom so in. This, yeah. Yeah. It's this constant macro micro feeling when I'm teaching of getting in tight and then backing out, looking at the results, getting in tight, backing out, looking at the result. So that's what that sanding is for me, is this idea that we go from a general proficiency, a general accuracy, you know, hit the target. We don't have to care if it's a bullseye right now, just hit the target, mm. and then we'll, uh, we'll start to shape that as we go along. Mm. Like, yeah. And the key that you're not doing that is that you feel frustrated as a teacher, and the student feels frustrated. Yeah. And, and frustration, um, it's going to be a part of learning, but it shouldn't be a part that stays with you. It should be something you recognize and then you adjust to immediately. Yeah. Now, you mentioned golf before. There's a lot of sporting met metaphors in, mm. uh, in particularly the first book, uh, Coffee with Ray. Why yeah. did you choose to use sporting practice metaphors? Um, one was because when I wrote some of that chapter, I was taking my son to a baseball place to learn how to hit. So uh, it was it was where I was at. I also, you know, the idea of a diamond distinction had preceded that and a baseball diamond. So there was a cute little, to me, a tie in there. Mm -hmm. But also, I think because often um, sport coaches and music teachers are on, are, are, are on opposite sides of the coin. And we're not because we're educating kids. Yeah. So there was, a, there was a little bit of a hopefulness um, that – a really good coach of an of a an, of a sport would recognize that, and I got really fortunate in that. Um, one of the reviewers, um, I got a call from a local cafe who was stocking my book, and he said, "There's a gentleman who wants your phone number. His name is um, Mike Hebron." I'm like, "I know Mike Hebron. My son, he runs the golf school up here." He goes, "I says, give him, give him my number." So Mike Hebron happened to be one of the top ten PGA teachers of the year. And he goes, I read your book. He's, he's a sort of, he's this wonderfully uh, gruff but funny um, <laughs> Irishman, older man. But I read your book. I'm like, oh, hey, good. He goes, yeah, you got some good stuff in there. Let's get together for lunch. And it was like that. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> no. um, so, and he said, he goes, it was wonderful to see. He actually asked, he goes, is that place on Long Island? The place that was mentioned in the book. Yeah. Because if it is, got the location wrong. I'm like, no, it's just... It's, uh, there's pieces of everything mixed, moshed, and it's sort of a collage of my brain and places I've been. Yeah. Um, and he read it and he goes, it's, it's what you do as a music teacher is what I do as a golf instructor. Yeah. And uh, so it was just one of, yeah, it was, for me it was a little bit hopefulness that sport coaches would also pick up on that and, and see the same the similarities. Mm. Well, uh, yeah, as much as music and sport are often, particularly in schools, uh, kind of a, a yeah. butting heads all the time, we, yeah. we, do, we do teach the, the repetition of practice and I often use the metaphor of uh, students 
um, learning a sport aren't always playing a match. You're, mm-hmm. you know, if you're playing tennis, you're hitting forehands over and over again. You're, you know, whatever it is, volleys. You don't, off, you don't often go to training and play a match. So yeah, in, right. in, in piano practice, you've got to do the practice before you play the piece sort of thing. So Wonderful. I think there's a lot of connections between sport uh, and music. Perhaps that's why I, I, another reason I enjoyed the book. Hey, I can't believe it. We're, we're almost up to an hour. Uh, it's been so great, 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 great talking to you. Um, yeah. I just wanted to, um, to finish with a quote from um, Lessons with Matt, uh, which is one of my favorite, and I think it's a kind of good way to, to sum things up. Uh, it's about dreams and goals and things like that. But before I do that, was there anything else that uh, you reckon we've missed in our conversation today that's that's kind of crucial? Um, yeah, I, I guess for me the most important thing is as uh, you know we're out there for our students as teachers, and if you're doing it, you're putting a lot on the line. You're, you if you're a teacher with integrity, you're putting a lot on the line every time you go out there. And one of the things I see often is that teachers they get tired. And my, my, anytime I speak to teachers, it's always uh, my, my message to them at the end is this is all important for how we work with our students, but we can't give what we don't have. You've got to take care of yourself in this process, too. You've got to be kind to yourself in this process. Mm. Often when teachers start trying to in, you know, institute and, uh, um, and put these, these ideas to practice, they get frustrated because their responses are latent. Um, you know, they'll walk out of a lesson and go, oh, I should have said that. Mm-hmm. And they... You know, you know, and and to me, it's you know, well. No, you did the right thing with the skills you have. You know, you'll you'll never listen. I honestly believe that as a teacher, you'll never if you you'll never choose incorrectly based upon the data you have and the skills you have. Now, a second later, you might have new information, new data, and a different set of skills, and you might look back a second and go and go, whoa, what was I thinking? But at the moment, you chose whether you were fully frustrated, whether you were lack of sleep. You, you chose accurately. It might not have been as effective as you had originally planned. Mm. So be kind to yourself in the process. Know that just as your students are growing, I'm hoping you're growing also. And don't, don't, um, and don't shy away from the kids that are hard to teach. You know, anyone can teach the kids who are easy. Mm. But I didn't learn anything from the kids who are easy. I learned all this stuff from the kids that challenged me. We ask our kids to take challenges every day and grow. Well, well their playing field is the music they get to do. Our playing fields of teaching we get to do, all the facilitating we get to do. Take the challenges on and, and learn yourself as well. Yeah, I love it. We are very hard on ourselves quite often. Um, and it's, it's good to, particularly over this, uh, over, over the break, I'm not sure when this podcast will come out, but it'll be pretty soon after the, uh, the holiday period, I'd guess. So hopefully everyone's had time to refresh and, and reflect on things. But the, um, the quote that, that I found that I really loved, it's not specifically about teaching at all, but... Uh, resonated well with me it said this your dream becomes your wish once you think about it your wish becomes your goal once you write it down your goal becomes your commitment when you give it a deadline and your commitment becomes reality once you pave the road with the bricks of your labor Mm. Uh, it's like absolute poetry to me but so so important and uh i've i've always had a very logical structured mind and i love writing down goals and and ticking off lists and things like that so uh i I thought that was really really nice way and i think that was in your second book uh lessons with matt at some stage so um yeah look fantastic it's been so good good chatting with you i think i could uh could continue it on for a while but let's wrap it up now can you tell everyone where they can find out more information about you and your books sure um you can go to Amazon if you type in Nick Ambrosino or if you type in Coffee with Ray and Lessons with Matt. Those books will come up there. They're available um, in Kindle version and in, in hard copy. They're also available on Smashwords and Goodreads for downloads. Um, and then I also have a website, nickambrosino.com, um, which I'm sure you can just you type the link out when you put this out, right? Yeah, well, I'll put it uh, in the notes, yeah. Yeah. And then also my Facebook page, Nick Ambrosino Author which is when I'm posting like the new books coming out. I'm working on another one. It'll probably be another year before this one comes out. And, uh, and some people have requested sort of a workbook for Lessons with Matt and Coffee with Ray. So I'm playing with that idea. I'm not quite sure if it's going to happen. But uh, yeah, that's, that's the best places to reach me. Fantastic. Yeah, I could see some potential in a workbook. And is the book, yeah. uh, the next book, is that a, a continuation with the same characters or are you moving to oh. something different? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm gonna move to something different. I think I've said what I need to say with Matt and Ray at this point. I think yeah. they're 
We're done. Um, some of the other things that interest me right now is um, family and parenting. Um, you know, uh, one of one of the one I had posted something recently in Facebook, and someone said, "That's your next book." I go, "What would it be about?" She said, "Life." I'm like, "Well, that's a that's, <laughs> that's a nice niche topic." Yeah, yeah, I'll just write a chapter. So yeah, it's going to be something there, but it's definitely going to be something about just uh, challenging people to grow and um, and be kind to themselves in the process. Fantastic! I look forward to reading it when it comes out. Thank you, Tim. Nick Ambrosino. Thank you so much for your time. It's been great having you on the show. My pleasure. All right. Take care. Catch you later. Bye.